Hi, it's Professor Streeter, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about our discussion forum topic that's due on Wednesday. And the focus this week is on the structure of this text and how to read an ancient poem like Gilgamesh. Um, there's many ways to talk about structure. At the most basic level is the structure of a line, a line of poetry. So I've got the text here. We have uh, the first tablet, so it's divided into 11 tablets, and it's a poem. And so you can see there are sort of stanzas, although they're not, they don't all have the same number of lines. Some poetry, you know, each stanza will have the same number of lines. It's not true here. But there are chunks. Think about the sort of chunks and, and why they're chunked the way they are. Um, but each line has a kind of structure. So, for example, Lombardo in his translation, as he says at the top of uh, his preface about this edition on page 26 of his preface, he says, my verse line, typically two main stresses on either side of a central syntactic pause, is intended to be analogous to the original's verse. So right there, we'll try to read out loud what that sounds like, but two main stresses, emphases, on either side of a central pause in each line. And he's doing that because it comes closer to the original verse in the original language. Uh, the oldest surviving version of this poem goes back to two dead languages, Sumerian and Akkadian, which have their roots in ancient Mesopotamia along the, the civilizations that developed along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in, 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 in what's now Iraq. But those languages, those ancient languages, um, that's the, the original poem was written in those languages. And so Lombardo's decision to translate each line with two main stresses on either side of a central pause is an attempt to get closer to how it would have sounded in the original. Um, and so you can try to read some of the lines in the text out loud for yourself and try to get a hang of that structural element of the poem, the way it sounds. Um, for example, on page three in the first tablet. It was he who built the great walls of Uruk. We can hear the stress on either side of a pause. At least I'm trying to do that. You can try to do it yourself. It was he who built, is the first stress, and then you have a pause. The great walls of Uruk built the wall of Iyana, Ishtar's pure storehouse. You can still see it all, the outer walls, cornice, gleaming like copper in the sun, the inner wall, beyond all comparison, run your hands over the threshold, feel how ancient it is. Okay, I'm trying to read it the way Lombardo translated it, and he did that because he thinks it comes closer to the way it would have sounded in the original Sumerian or the original Akkadian. I've included, um, on D2L, a link to a site that has someone reading out loud what the ancient Akkadian would have would have sounded like. Uh, maybe we can you can try to listen to that on your own. We can listen to it together on Wednesday. But that's the first point about structure. Each line is a line of poetry that is supposed to be sung, have a certain sound, a certain rhythm to it, like a song. Uh, the second point about structure I already suggested is divided into different tablets. These titles for each tablet, the creation of Enkidu, this tablet one, but uh, that's something that Lombardo put there. It's not there in the original. And the way the lines are divided into chunks, I was suggested. So we have the line number here, okay, in the margin, and that corresponds to the lines of the original text that were carved in stone, okay? But many of those lines are missing. Many of those stones have marks on them where we don't know what, what was written there. The, the translator's job is to try to figure out through context what was there. Um, but the translator also decides where to put these lines in between chunks of the text, right? That's not there on the original stone. So again, Lombardo is organizing the text um, the way he thinks comes closest to the original. Um, okay. So that's another uh, point about structure. As you're reading through the text, you might, you're going to encounter lots of names of characters, gods, goddesses, human beings. The, it becomes confusing. Uh, who are these people? Who are these characters? So you can remind yourself of that by going to the glossary in the back of the text, glossary of deities, persons, and places, 
and it has the name as it appears in the poem, and then a description of who these people are, who these gods are, uh, where these places were. So that'll help you keep track of, again, that's a, a structural point or a reading point, right? It's, the names are an important part of the poem, and they would have been recognizable to the original audience. They're not recognizable to us anymore, so we have to go back and remind ourselves. Um, okay, so there's a couple things about structure, the this, this structure of the book that we have in our hands, uh, and the, the poem that Lombardo has translated for us. Uh, let me put myself down in the bottom of the screen, and we'll go now to look at the discussion topic for this week, and I've posted it in the discussion forum. You can click it here in announcements. And um, let me just start reading to you and talking you through it. <clears throat> so last week was a pretty basic question. I, I wanted to get your sort of first impressions of the story or of the introduction and the preface that you read and sort of what you learned from your, your initial reading and what was interesting and important about that. This week, I'd like you to go into more depth and think about the structure of what you're reading and try to write about that. Okay, so i give you some context to the discussion topic. As many scholars have pointed out, Gilgamesh is a poem full of gaps. Now, some of those gaps are, part, are a result of the fact that we found these clay tablets buried in the ground and they were damaged and we simply don't have the original text. Okay. So, but also the, the way the poem was written by the, the poets going back thousands of years, they don't give you all the details. So it's a poem full of gaps that leave room for the imagination of the reader to fill in. Notice that in the, the, the version that we have from Lombardo, the very beginning of the poem is a kind of prologue from the scribe asking you to go back in time in your imagination to remember a time long ago when Gilgamesh was king. He's writing this story down around 1100 BC, but Gilgamesh, is at least in, is based on an historical king that was supposed to have lived about 1500 years earlier. So the poet in the prologue, that first page and a half of the poem, is asking you imaginatively to kind of go back and remember the way Uruk looked you know, visit the city in your mind and remember this ancient long gone king. Um, and then we begin the story of Gilgamesh and the creation of Enkidu after that prologue. We're sort of back in the time of Gilgamesh, back in the ancient time of Uruk. So, but throughout the poem, especially in the beginning, right? the reader is asked to kind of imagine and put themselves back in this time, back in this place, and fill in some of the gaps in the story that aren't told, right? Not everything is told to you by the poem or by the poet. You have to kind of imagine the rest of the details yourself. So this is also something that is in some ways true of Genesis, uh, the other book that we're starting to read this week, uh, that first book of the Hebrew Bible. And here is a scholar's way of putting the point that I'm trying to make here. Michael Schmidt says, as in the Bible, details that are not crucial to the moral plot are left out. This is a quote from a book called Gilgamesh, The Life of a Poem by a man named Michael Schmidt, published in 2019. So I've given you the reference there. That's to help start thinking about how to cite a text when you write. Anyway, to give an example, we're not told anything about what happens on the three-day trip that the hunter takes with Shamhat from the city when they leave the city and go to the drinking hole in Tablet 1 to meet Enkidu. Uh, and then there's these 150-mile treks that Enkidu and Gilgamesh take on their way to meet Humbaba in the cedar forest. Again, we're not told what happens there. These are examples of gaps or details that are left out. Now, on Schmidt's reading, presumably, this is because those details don't make a difference to the moral of the story. We don't need to know what happened on that hike. We don't need to know what happened on that three-day trip. It doesn't have any relevance to the, the moral of the story. Okay, so this is Michael Schmidt's point, not only about Gilgamesh, but he thinks this is true of Genesis. The, the writing leaves out a lot of details. Okay. So for this week's discussion topic, I would like you to think about 
what I call the narrative and thematic structure of this ancient text and how you as a reader reconstruct the story and the themes of the story out of the various parts that the poet gives you. Okay, so what I'd like you to do before you answer the questions on the discussion post in your notebook, take out a notebook. I have a yellow notepad that looks like this. Um, I don't know what your notes look like, but you know this is this is mine. Uh, take out your notes and start identifying what you see as the crucial details of the action in the story, or the dialogue between characters, or, or the dramatic tensions and the dramatic relationships that the characters have, the dramatic events. Identify what you see as the crucial details of, of what's happening in in the poem. All right. So here's a hint. One, one thing you can pay attention to is repetition. That's another formal point. A lot of things get repeated in this story or in this poem, uh, so pay attention to the repetition. That will help you maybe identify what's the, the crucial events, right, or, or the, the crucial details of the story. So in your notes, in your notebook, start tracing in outline the major narrative stages of the poem in the first, just the first five tablets, okay? Um, for each stage of the narrative, you know, jot down a sentence or two in your notes that explains the significance uh, uh, for the moral plot or the overarching structure and theme of the poem as a whole. So here I want to think about the moral plot as what's the overarching structure of the, of the narrative? What's the thematic structure of the poem? Um, okay, so how does each detail of the, of, of, of the story that you identify how does each you know, major stage of the narrative, how does it contribute to the overarching structure or theme of the poem as a whole? Um, to give some examples of major narrative stages or crucial details of the poem, uh, we have in the, 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 the story really begins after the prologue in the city of Uruk with the people complaining to the god Anu. Right? Gilgamesh, the king, is... I don't know how you want to put it, abusing his power. He's a restless king. He seems to have no boundaries. The people complain to the god, Anu. That's sort of the first major event. And everything that happens after that follows from the complaint of the people. For, by the end of Tablet 5, we have the killing of Humbaba, the, this monster in the, in the forest, although how monstrous he really is becomes a kind of question. Um, and the chopping down of the best trees in the forest, right? After they kill Humbaba, they chop down all the cedar trees. And that's where Tablet 5 ends. Okay, so before Wednesday's class, take out your notes and fill in all of the gaps in between, right? all the crucial details of the rest, rest of the plot in your own notes between the complaint of the people to the god Anu and the killing of Humbaba. What are the, the, the major narrative stages of the poem? in between those two events, okay? So once you've got your notes kind of written down, then you can use that as a guide for answering the discussion questions. And this is the part that I want you to post online. I don't want you to post all of your notes online, but once you've got your notes, you can use them to think about answers to these questions. Okay, the first question, what are the major narrative stages of the first five tablets of Gilgamesh and how do they fit together? Try to think about how those, those narrative stages fit together. Um, describe as best you can in as much detail as you can the overarching structure of the poem from tablet one to tablet five, those first five tablets. How and why do you think the poet focuses your attention on these details? Right? The poet is trying to focus you on, 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 on certain details of the story. Um, how does the poet do that? Why is the poet focusing your attention there? Okay. That's the first question. The second question is to think about the other side of it. What's left out? Right? What are the gaps in the story? What is the poet not showing you? Or part of the problem, as I said, is we have uh, we don't have the text, right? The the, the, the original um, tablets with with the inscriptions of the story are, are 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 incomplete. So, however you think about the gaps, like what's being left out? What are some of the mysteries of the story that are not answered by the text? In other words, if you had to fill in some of the gaps of the story, how would you begin to do that? Um, okay, so, the, so again, think about this in terms of concrete examples. Right? 
uh, questions you have about the story that aren't answered by the text, right? What, 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 what is the poet leaving out?